was really excited uh, when Mason said, oh, we, uh, we've, we've been going through the book of Luke and I love the book of Luke. And um, I've spent the last 20 years being a topical preacher, speaking on mission, you know, reaching our community for Christ. And I'll never stop preaching that. But uh, when he said we move, we're going through the book of Luke, I thought, oh, that's wonderful. Just don't ask me to do Luke 16. <laughs> and I said, what do you got on this way? He goes, Luke 16. And uh, uh, so one, two wonderful stories that I want to touch on and look at and uh, just allow God's word to speak to us. And that's my prayer. My prayer is, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you reveal what you're trying to say, bring understanding, highlight things that we need to hear, and maybe even reveal things that we've never known before as well. So we see in this story, in these two parables, these two stories of Christ, um, uh, remembering that parables are something for those that have ears to hear, to listen to. The Pharisees, they didn't have ears to hear and they uh, they laughed at Jesus and they mocked him and ridiculed him often. And Jesus was sharing these two wonderful stories. And so this morning, I just want to reflect on those, have a look at those and um, dig into it. Uh, the the um, the heading of my message today is lessons in godly stewardship what we do with our money our finances our income our time here on earth absolutely impacts what happens in eternity this chapter is as much to do about money and finances as it is to do about time we'll see that the short time we have here on earth has the potential to have a powerful impact on others for eternity. So let's get into it. Uh, let's, let's have a look at the first story. Let's look at the characters, the propositions, the outcomes, and then the lessons. Let's have a look at the characters first. First, you have the rich man in this story. Uh, it's not uncommon for rich families uh, back in these times to have managers of their estates who would lodge with them eat at their table and manage their assets, their land, their property, their houses, uh, their businesses, uh, the crops that grow, uh, and, um, and also the wine. And um, I say the wine because my surname is Butler, and it originates from the French word bottler. And the, the head of a rich man's house, the head servant is the butler. And the reason why the butler's the head of the house is because he was in charge of the bottles, the wine. Let's put the person in charge of the wine. He's the most important person because that's very important. And so we see this. We have the rich man who has his house and uh, his business. It says this in Luke. Um, we, we, we see this unveiled a little bit more in Luke 14, which you would have looked at uh, a couple of chapters ago, 14 verse 18, when, when a certain man uh, put out invitations to a great, a great banquet, the invitations that went out. And one of the excuses of the people who didn't turn up to the great banquet was a rich man who said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. And you'd never buy a block of land, you'd never buy a house sight unseen, but it was most likely that this rich man had a manager who bought the property and he wanted to go and have a look at it because his manager bought the property. We see once again uh, that described in, verse, in chapter 14 and verse 18. You have the rich man, you also have the manager. This manager was accused of wasting his master's possessions. When you haven't had to sacrifice for your wealth, it's very easy to squander. Who understands that concept? When you haven't had to work for it, it's very easy. Um, I was trying, I was racking my brain thinking, and there's so many stories in my life, but when I was a kid, uh, I went to a private school and my parents used to buy me blazers, but I'd take a blazer off playing sport and then I'd forget about it. And um, Mum and dad had to buy so many blazers for me because I was leaving. And then they got fed up. They just said, that's it. We're not buying anything for you anymore because I didn't know the cost of what that blazer costs. It cost, a lot of, it cost them a lot of money. And so, in effect, I squandered. And so my, my parents said, that's it. Well, you're not going to have a blazer. And I got in trouble a few times at school because I wasn't wearing the school blazer. We also see this in the prodigal son in Luke 15 and verse 11. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. He didn't have to work for it. His father earned it. Give me my share. And he went out and he squandered it. 
I had a footy player, one of the top AFL players, I'll mention his name because he's made this public in his book, uh, David Schwartz, The Ox. Um, Schwarter was at one stage the most highly paid AFL player, uh, but he writes in his book that, and, that he squandered, he made millions of dollars. When he finished his career, he had none of his money. It was all gone. He, he, he wasted it all on betting, on the tote. And he tells of this story that when he worked his first full-time job or his first job where he actually had to do hard work for it, he said he lent some money to a mate and his mate said he would pay him back, but he never paid him back. It was like $20. And he said it for the first time in his life, he got angry because I worked hard for that money. And this guy hasn't given me my money back. And he said it was the first time in his life, the money early, it just came so easily and he was able to squander it. And, and, and we see that he didn't have to work hard for it. And we see this in verse 3 of Luke 16, when the manager said, what am I going to do now? My master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. So he devised a plan. In verse 4, it says, I know what I'll do. When I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. He thought to himself, I'm finished here. My master has caught me out. Like the prodigal son came to this moment of awakening of what he's done. It sort of hit him like that moment when he was with the pigs, the prodigal son or the lost son said, what am I doing here? This manager thought, my master has caught me out. He became aware of his situation and he devised a shrewd and self-serving plan. He was just thinking about himself. I had the privilege of a number of years ago going to the, the, the Global Leadership Sun at, at um, Willow Creek and there was a speaker there by the name of Adam Grant and he wrote a book called Give and Take and he says in any organisation, in any group, in any community there are people that are givers and there are people that are takers. There are people that love to give their time. They give their energy, they give, they give information, they give it away freely, they love to give. In a, in a business, there are people that are takers. They're just there to take. He says, the majority of people in the middle are called matches. You do a little bit for me, and I'll do a little bit for you. I'll help you here as long as you help me there. And the enemy of the takers are the matches. Because the takers just want to take. But the matches says, you're not going to take... You've got to give me something back in return. So the matches keep the takers on us, but you have the givers and the takers. And there was a very interesting thought that Adam Grant brought up. He said, of these three different types of people, or in particular the two, the givers and the takers, he said there are agreeable and disagreeable type of people. Agreeable people are just people you love to be around. Uh, they're affirming, they're encouraging, they're just great to be around. Disagreeable people, a bit grumpy, um, <laughs> uh, at the Melbourne Footy Club, my reflection is the guys on the door that let people in and out of the change rooms, guess what? They were pretty grumpy. No, you're not getting in here. Um, no, you're not getting in there. Um, and uh, so you had agreeable and disagreeable people. And Adam Grant said, you know, the hardest people to identify for any business is the agreeable taker. Because everyone loves them, but they're just there for themselves. And here we have a manager who was probably, um, he was a manager because he was capable, he had friends, he knew how to use people to his own advantage. Switch up, there we go. Oh, sorry, thank you. Okay. So you have agreeable takers and this manager would have been an agreeable taker. People would have loved him, thought, oh, what a great guy this is. But he was self-serving, he was shrewd, he was looking after himself. Make no mistake, this manager was a wicked man. He was lazy, he squandered, he mismanaged, he looked after himself, he wasn't particularly interested in his master, nor was he interested in his master's business. Because if he was, he would have looked after that business. He was only interested in his own present situation and also his future comfort and financial state. Jesus is trying to send a message here to us and wanting it to be very clear to us when you live for money you'll be controlled 
by money. You cannot serve two masters. One's going to have mastery over you. So you had the you had the 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 owner or the ma uh, the rich man, the master. You had the manager, but you also had the business customers, the customers uh, of. Uh, uh, in this story. They were likely to be other rich men who had businesses of their own. They saw the manager as a supplier of primary goods, olive oil and wheat. And so the manager's proposition was this. Uh, he says in verse uh, 6, how much do you owe my master? Lovely. Thank you for that. Don't press the mute button. Don't push. Did I push the mute button? What I did, I was getting too excited. There we go. Everyone say, don't push the mute button. So yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks for that. Um, so you have these business customers and, and, and they purchase wine and the manager made a proposition. He said, how much do you owe my master? And the first one said 900 gallons or 3,000 litres of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 450, cut it in half. Uh, on, on the text, it was 100 and cut it in 50. So it was 50% of that. Who's got an olive tree in their garden? Give me a wave, anyone got an olive tree? Yeah, I've got a, in the front of my house, just up in Parkdale, I've got a Kalamata olive tree. And uh, about two months ago, I harvested, I got about five kilograms of olives off the tree, which is roughly about 800 olives. Those 800 olives that I took off my tree may, if you were to press it down, makes one litre of, of olive oil. Wow. So this guy says, I've got 3,000 litres of olive oil. That relates, well, if you want to compare that, that, that requires 2.4 million olives that would be picked off about 3,000 olive trees. So this is substantial. This rich man had a big property with a lot of olive trees. It's very likely this manager sold the olive, the oil at cost price. Would it cost them to pick it, to have servants and slaves to pick it and to press it and then put it into jars and to provide it to this guy? And then he asked the second Customer, how much do you owe a thousand bushels or 30 tons of wheat? He replied, he told him, take your bill and make it 800. I'll give you a 20% discount. And so he wrote it out. Uh, this 30 tons of wheat roughly equates to a million bowls of wheat bix. <laughs> I got online, how much is in a wheat bix? How much wheat? And I found a million bowls of wheat bix. Now I like my wheat bix, but I'm never going to have a, a million bowls. So it was again, very substantial. So the manager made amazing deals with these customers. Now, not to help out the rich man or his business, rather to win favour with these customers. So when he needed a job or a place to stay or some personal favours, they would oblige. He wasn't thinking of the master. So what were the outcomes? Jesus says in verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. And this idea of the people of light are the followers of Jesus. John 1, 4 and 5 says, In him, talking of Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus was the light, the light of men. The people of the light are his followers. They're people that believe, that trust in him, that make Jesus Christ Lord of their lives. And I really believe that the major test of the Lordship of Christ in our lives is how we view and how we handle money. Remember many years ago, uh, many, many years ago, uh, the Lord challenged me to give my whole month's wage back to him. It's a really tough moment, but I really felt him just, me personally, I had to speak to my wife about it. I just felt the Lord was saying, give my whole, we live from month to month. We didn't have very much savings at all. I was in ministry and serving in a local church and I just felt 
the Lord said, Cam, I want you to trust me. And so we made a decision. We'll, we'll pay our tithes and we'll pay our bills, our rent and uh, any utilities that we own. And then the rest we'll give to the Lord. And I remember doing that and it was quite harrowing because we had four kids and uh, we didn't have a mortgage. We had rent. Um, it was a really tough moment. But I know what the Lord was doing. He was testing my heart when it came to finances and lordship. Do I trust him? Now, I'm not saying this for you. I'm not saying you to do this. But there are moments in our lives the Lord tests us when it comes to our finances. Who's the Lord? Am I Lord? Or is your income your finances? Do they dictate your countenance, your mood, whether you're happy or whether you're sad? So we see a few lessons in this story, this first story. And the first one was to take responsibility. Actually, just before I get there, can I just say that month that I released those finances, the next day or like two days after our washing machine just died. Oh, we got all this. And we had, we had some family that were there when it died. And they said, you know what? We would love to buy you a new washing machine. And I'm thinking, how are we going to afford a washing machine? They just out of the blue said, we'd love to buy. Oh, are you sure? Yeah, yeah, we'd love to. So they bought us a brand new $800 washing machine. And, and then we were taken out with friends. And whatever we did that month, it was sort of like, oh, people were paying for us. And, and I just, because I was very hyper aware, we don't have hardly anything. But the Lord made a way and helped us through those moments. And it was just a real trusting time. And uh, the Lord was faithful through it all. But I see a few lessons in this story that Jesus tells, this parable. And the first one is that I want to highlight is, number one, that we need to take responsibility for our situation, not to lament, not to sook, now, to do something when things go wrong. When you find yourself in a tough, hard, self-inflicted moment in, in your life, then do something. Avoid lamenting. Maybe you lament or you feel sad for a moment, but then take responsibility and do something about it. Don't remain in your sorrow. A few years back, um, I was talking to Neil Danaher. Neil Danaher was for 10 years our coach at Melbourne, and now he's the face of Fight MMD. And I was on the phone to him talking to him about another person that I knew that was struggling with motor neuron disease. And I was talking to him and how, how he was going. And he said, Cam, when I first heard about it, he said, I felt sorry for a day. And he said, I woke up the next morning and I'm thinking, how's that doing for you, Neil? He thought to himself, how, how, how's that doing, feeling sorry for yourself? And immediately he thought, I'm going to do something about this. And together with a few guys like Bill Guest and a few others, they set up the Fight MMD and they had that, the, the, you know, the slide, the big freeze at the MCG. On, uh, they had it last week or a couple of weeks ago and they slide into the icy bars. And that all came out of Neil because... He, he had a moment of lamenting, but he thought, I've just got to do something about it now. It was John Kennedy Sr. in the 1975 VFL Grand Final against North Melbourne, a very famous excerpt. His exhortation to the Hawthorne players at half time was, at least do something. Do. <laughs> I should have had the video up there. If you remember that video clip, he tells him to do something. They were feeling like they had their back. They were feeling bad. They were feeling not good. They were feeling like, oh, this is hopeless. And he just says, do something about it. I believe very strongly that God loves people who have a resolve of doing something rather than doing nothing. Acting rather than lamenting. Stepping out in faith rather than cowering in fear taking responsibility rather than excusing themselves for laziness or excusing laziness. We see this in Matthew 25 in the parable of the talents. In verse 26, the master rebukes the lazy servant who did nothing with what his master had given him. who, by the way, received one talent, which is the equivalent of around 20 years of a labourer's wage, $1.3 million in today's money. 
the guy that got five talents, 6.5, the, the one that received 10 talents, $13 million. You couldn't say that this one who just received one talent received little, he received $1.3 million. Go and do something with it. Oh, I know you to be a hard man, master. So uh, I just, I just, I didn't want to make sure I didn't want to lose anything. So I sat on it. I did nothing. If there's something rewarding to draw out of this parable, it's that we need to take responsibility to move on, to trust God in our lives. Maybe you felt stuck. Maybe you're feeling stuck and you don't know what to do. I want to encourage you to place your trust in the Lord, to put your hand to the plough, to, to move ahead, to move forward. Hebrews 10.35, when it's speaking about the men and women of faith, Hebrews 10.35, one of my favourite verses in the Bible says, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. Rather, we are those who believe, who have confidence and are saved. We're saved in the Lord. We're not going to shrink back. We're not going to cower. We're not going to lament. We're going to place our trust in the Lord. The other lesson that we can take from this first story that Jesus shares with us is to understand the condition of man's heart, the true condition of man's heart, the people of this world towards money versus the outlook of followers of Jesus or those who are of the light. The people of this world are far more shrewd when it comes to money than we are. They place their confidence in it. They twist and turn with it. They manipulate it. They dodge taxes. They avoid paying debts. They get litigious. They control people with money. They'll fight and fight to the death over money. They'll break up families, marriages and relationships over money. They'll accuse, trick, manipulate outcomes to benefit themselves. And at times, to appease their conscience, they'll give money to charity or something that's worthy. And they'll make out they'll give to charity, but even then they'll hold it back for themselves. You don't have to think too far in Bible terms. And remember Ananias and Sapphira. People of this world are far more shrewd when it comes to money. But Jesus knows the condition of man's heart towards money. He knows that he's consumed by it. It controls him. It makes him feel happy or makes him feel sad. Money becomes his idol. That's why one third of his 39 parables that Jesus shares, one third of them speak to money and income. He knows how it affects us. Many of the gospel stories of Levi, the tax collector, the rich young ruler, Jesus speaks to these men, to these people about it. In the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, 19, 21, Jesus declares, do not store for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What's really significant about this passage here is the whole Sermon on the Mount was Jesus inaugurating the kingdom of God. And it wasn't a physical kingdom. It was a kingdom where the king would rule people's hearts. So when I go into the Melbourne Football Club, I'm not trying to turn Melbourne into a church. I don't want to turn it into a church. But I want to see hearts in that place bow to Jesus, yield to Jesus, place their trust in Jesus. Over the years that I was there, I was able to pray with board members, presidents, players who bowed their heart to Jesus. And Jesus says, where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. He's saying, don't put your, don't put your heart, don't make your treasure your finance and your wealth. Those things will fade away. 
rather place your heart, give me your heart, yield your heart to me. We see this in the parable of the wealthy fool. You would have looked at Mason, you would have looked at this in Luke 10. God said to the wealthy fool, he said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own all the things you have prepared? So it is for the one who continues to store up and hoard possessions for himself. And it is not rich and is not rich in his relationship towards God. Paul exhorts us in Ephesians 5 and verse 5 not to be motivated by greed nor be idolatrous. The Amplified Bible says loving things more than loving God. And then in verse 8 he says walk as children in the light. The same as Jesus used in, in this story, the children of the light. Don't be greedy, don't be idolatrous. Don't love things more than you love God. Give God your whole heart. So we see a couple of things here. Let's, let's be people who take responsibility. Understand the condition of our heart that at times it wants to master our lives. We need to hand over the lordship of our heart to Christ. And finally, the last lesson is Jesus exhorting us, his people, with is to use money for kingdom purposes. Verse 9 says, I tell you, use wealth, worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you'll not, so you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. I love the Amplified Bible in verse 9 says this, and I tell you, learn from this, make friends for yourself for eternity by means of the wealth of unrighteousness. That is, use material resources as a way to further the work of God so that when it runs out, they will welcome you into eternal dwellings. It's clear here that Jesus is not saying that you can't have wealth. He's not saying that at all. Nor is he saying you can't enjoy it. You can enjoy it in gratitude to God who provides it to you. Rather, use it to honour God for his purposes for kingdom purposes. Simply Jesus is teaching us this. Let's use the wealth that we are blessed with for kingdom purposes, for kingdom business, for kingdom building, for eternal purposes, for drawing nearer to God and to allow others to draw nearer to God also. As I said earlier, many times I've been challenged um, by the Lord about my money, my finances, um, a couple of years ago, um, the Holy Spirit quickened me as I was reading, I was actually hearing a sermon at another church in Melbourne. I heard the minister preaching on Acts 2 and the early church and they gathered together and they had communion. And, and it says there that the people saw those that were in need and they sold two things, their property and their possessions. Not the properties they lived in, but the extra properties they had to help those that were in need are really marked. And I felt the Holy Spirit really quicken me personally that I, I, I've actually got to help somebody in my church. He said, Cam, if you want a church that's thriving, it's a church that looks out for brothers and sisters who are in need. So I said to my pastor, I'm an elder on a church, in, as I mentioned earlier, in Maryborough, and I, I had a picture of one of the families there that weren't too well off. And didn't have their own house or their own dwelling, but I found out later they did and they actually had really expensive cars and a few things that were sort of hidden away. But the minister said, there's this other family over there, that couple, and they're a young couple with a young daughter and they lived in, in, a, in a country farm that was only $80 a week um, and they were saving up for their own place, but they just didn't have enough. And so I was just quickened. And I want to share this story to encourage you in no way take anything. But the Holy Spirit quickened me. How can I help them? How can I bless them to get them going? And we're in the process now of seeing them get into their own property. And it's so exciting to sow into them, to bless them out of the blue. That was the first time I've ever done something publicly. Other times I do things privately in, in secret and bless people and sow into people. But I think it's so important as followers of the Lord that we are committed to use our money, our resources for kingdom business to bless one another, those that are in need to bless them. 
I think it's so good. So here's the pivotal lesson in Luke 16, and we're going to pivot over to the second story just to, to finish up. Learn from this, Jesus says, use material resources as a way to further the work of God. We're going to see now in the other story how important this is. The rich man and Lazarus. So we had the, we had the rich ruler who had his property and a manager who misused it. Jesus was teaching us how he used that money for kingdom purposes. Then he tells this other story of the rich man and Lazarus. And again, the characters, the rich man, like in the previous parable, who likely had managers and servants who wore the finest purple linen clothing and lived in a compound that had gates on the outside. But just like all men, rich and poor, he lived for a period of time and then he died. Death was certain. He found himself not by Abraham's side, not in heaven, rather in Hades. He was in torment, agony, and perpetually parched. He could not get relief. He was without, with nothing, and significantly was aware or had awareness of what was happening. He could see from a distance what he was missing out on. You had Lazarus was a legitimately poor beggar. Not only did he fossil for scraps from the rich man's banquets, his health was so bad that he had visible sores on his body. The rich man would have seen these sores and Jesus makes no mention that he did anything to alleviate them. Give me a wave if you're a dog man or a, who's, who loves dogs here? Give me a wave if you love dogs. Who loves cats? Anyone love cats? I just, as you, as you do, you discover you don't own a cat. The cat owns you. You own dogs, um, but you serve cats. Um, I'm a dog man. I don't mind cats, but uh, there's one thing you know about dogs. They can be pretty disgusting, can't they? They can, they can poop and then go and eat up there. Oh, we won't even go there. They can vomit. They'll go, oh, don't eat that. No. And they can just do terrible things. And here Jesus was painting a picture of dogs that were licking the sores of this man making it very, very pointed. In fact, Lazarus was probably so weak that he couldn't even shoo away the dog. Such was his pain, his lament, his weakness. When it comes to poverty in Australia, the poorest Australians are still in the not top 95 percentile in the world. Top 95 the poorest of the poor in Australia is still in the top 5% of the richest people in the world. KPM partner Richard Salt said recently the Norwegians were the richest people in the world with an average of US $90,000 per, $90, per man, woman and child or child, followed by the Swiss, number two, and then Australians, number three. We might not think we're rich, but in comparison with other nations, we are in fact a wealthy nation. That was his quote. We might not think we're rich, but in comparison to other nations, we in fact a very wealthy nation. And I say, I say that it's not that there aren't poor people that we need to bless, but I say it for this reason, because our poverty is a little bit different in Australia. We might not have poor financially, but we do have the poor we walk past every single day. Poor emotionally, poor relationally, poor mentally, poor in housing, in resources, poor in hope, poor in wisdom and quality of life. People who have been ripped off by a broken and sinful world laying in pieces all around about us. We walk past them every day. They might be in our workplace, in our office, people we sit next door to who are just broken. Some of them have gaping sores of their weaknesses, of their, of their lament, of what they're going through. Many don't. The poor all around us, the poor in spirit, broken. So you had the rich man, Lazarus, and then you had the rich man's family. The rich man said to Abram, send somebody, Lazarus, anyone, to warn them how to live so they won't face what I'm facing. Send somebody to them. Will you send somebody to them? 
Abraham replies in verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to them. No father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, even if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Jesus was alluding to something. I doubt if anyone got it at that moment, including the disciples. Jesus, not much long after, was going to die and rise from the dead. Yet people still don't believe. So what's the proposition? The proposition is simply this. Rich man, you had your chance. You had time and you did nothing with it. The rich man missed his opportunity to use his wealth, his money to bless and invest in what pleases God. So what was the outcome? The outcome was that the rich man lived for himself in the time he had on this earth. And because of his unwillingness to show mercy, he then suffered in solitude for eternity. Whereas the suffering beggar found mercy and grace and comfort in the arms of Abraham, because our God is a God of mercy and of grace and forgiveness and healing and hope, restoration and salvation. I remember one day I'd just finished um, I was pastoring a church in Doncaster and I left the church, put on my Melbourne jacket on Sunday morning and at about 11.30, maybe around 11.30, I'm walking around the MCG and I'm walking past hundreds and hundreds of families, mums and dads, children. And it hit me in the face as I was walking around there that there are all these families who love one another, that are beautiful families. They're, they have no knowledge of who Jesus is. I just read, read a report that week or that month about how 97% of Australians or 3% of Australians have an active weekly relationship with Christ, a real, they, they attend, to ch attend church at least once a month. It's a sense of God's real. And in my mind, those hundred people I just walked past, 97 of them were going to go to a lifeless eternity, just like this rich person. And who's out there telling them and their families that Christ loves them and died on the cross from... This is where I'm stirred by this passage here. Lord, let it not be said of me, or my friends and my family, or my brothers and sisters, that we walked past people that were impoverished in spirit, that they didn't know of the grace and the mercy of God, because God's heart is one of grace and mercy, that others might know about it, that others might receive it. And this man, Lazarus, was receiving it. Jesus was saying to the poor, was Jesus saying the, 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 the poor get a free pass into heaven? No. He's teaching us a lesson and I want to wrap things up here. What's the lesson? We have been given time. God gives, grants us time in this life. We have one chance to get it right. In verse 22, Jesus in the story says, the time came when the beggar died. And the rich man also died and was buried. The time came. In verse 25, Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things while Lazarus received bad things. The wonderful news is that God blesses us. He grants us income and wealth. It all comes from him anyway. It always, it's all his anyway. Every breath we breathe, everything that we have, comes from him and he grants us income and wealth likewise he also grants us time how we use it is so paramount can I ask you this morning how are you using your time how are you using your time for Jesus how are you using your wealth 
your income, your money, big or small, for Christ's kingdom. Remember, you can't serve two masters. And when you're faithful with little, whether you have just a little bit or you have a lot, when you're faithful with the little, he can entrust you with more. So Jesus wants us to learn to use our worldly wealth for his kingdom purpose, to take the good news of the kingdom to our brothers, our sisters in Christ and to those that are broken or lost, hurting, sitting outside the gate of our wealthy community. So what can we do practically? Here's a few things. Here's a few thoughts. What we can do. Take someone out. Take a neighbour out. Get to know them. Speak words of grace to them and their heart. Sow financial blessing into people around about you quietly, invisibly, without them knowing. Help that young, struggling family get into their first home. Give your used car to that single mum without a car. One of the great things that I loved about Willow Creek is they got that great program where when you finish with your used car, give it to the church. The church gets it all right, mechanically sound, and then they give it to single mums in the church and outside in the community and bless people with it. How good is that? I just love it. So financially. Bake a cake for someone and tell them they're special, much valued and deeply loved by God. Just do something with your time, with your money. We're encouraged to do that. Let's use our time wisely to build friends for eternity. My last story that I wanna share and then we'll pray is this. Uh, um, I was standing around the uh, footy club in the club rooms and I overheard some of the trainers talking about this guy, Charlie, and I sort of just, as you do, Mason, you, you go in and you, you put your ear and hear what people are talking about. This was during the week and, and it was near the Gatorade drinking fountain. And so they were talking about Charlie, what a lovely guy Charlie is and Charlie's dying of cancer and all of that. And I'm thinking, oh, who's this guy Charlie? And they said, oh, Charlie used to work. Well, he was a volunteer around the club for many, many years. He used to cut the hair of the players and, and the staff and just everyone loved Charlie. And I thought, oh, and, and he's dying of cancer, yeah. And, and I said, oh, what hospital's Charlie in? And they said, oh, he's in the Mercy Hospital. I thought, oh, okay. Uh, so I thought, oh, I might go and see. And the trainer said, oh, that'd be great, Rev, if you can. I didn't know this guy from a bar of soap, but he, he's, he's probably in a bad place. And anyway, so I was I just a few days later, you know, when you make a promise or, or you say, oh, yeah, I'll pray for you or I'll do this for you, but sometimes you forget and... Clearly I'd forgotten, except that I was driving past the Mercy and as I was going past and I saw the sign, the Mer- I thought, that's where that guy, ch- oh. So I pulled over and I had a meeting to get to and I thought, oh, blow the meeting, I'll, I'll just go in, I'll drop in and see Charlie. I've got this opportunity, I've got this time, I can do something right at this moment. And So I parked my car, I went there and I said, is Charlie so-and-so available? And they said, oh yeah, 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 he's on this floor so I didn't know what to expect I was wearing my Melbourne top so I was clearly sort of regalia in a in the jacket and I and I walk into the room and there's you know there's usually four beds um, and he was the only one that was occupied all the three other three were empty and as I walked in they looked at me and there was a a young girl, he was about 80 plus years of age and there was a young girl that was there and as I walked in I just said, oh, Charlie, and he goes, yeah, I go, oh, I'm Cameron, I'm the, I'm the Rev, I'm the, I'm the chaplain at Melbourne Footy Club, oh, you know, surprise look and he said, this is my daughter and she was very young but she's probably um, in her mid-30s, uh, sorry for those that are a bit younger, a bit older, but uh, so I, I, I just sat there and I said, Charlie, tell me your story. So for the next 90 minutes, he just talks about all these things. And as he's sharing his story, I'm sitting there and I, as I normally do, I was just saying, Holy Spirit, what do you want to, do you want to say something to Charlie? I didn't know whether Charlie had any faith or no faith or where he's at, but I, the Holy Spirit quickened a verse on my mind. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful for they. So I'm sitting there with him and he's sharing his stories and I'm asking a few little questions. Just at the end, I said, oh, Charlie, I've got to go now. But just as you were talking before, I just, I just, uh, this might mean something to you or not, but I just felt God wanted to share with you um, this Bible verse that 
says, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. And he nodded, he said, oh, thank you. And I said, can I pray with you? And as soon as I asked, can I pray with you? Charlie began to sob. Oh, really loud, it freaked me out. I'm thinking, what have I done? What have I triggered? Have I, oh. And he's like loud, oh, like a child screaming. And I was freaking out and his daughter saying, dad, it's all right, it's all right. I'm going, Charlie, it's all right. And this seemed to go on for, oh, it felt like many minutes, but it was probably only 30 seconds or maybe a minute. And he calmed down and I said, can I pray with you? He goes, yes. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And I just prayed for Charlie. I said, Jesus, I thank you that you love Charlie. I thank you for your word. They said, blessed are the merciful. Those who showed mercy, kindness. He was a man who showed kindness. He used to serve. He was a volunteer. He helped people. He did. I said, Lord, thank you for the, that they'll receive mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. And I just finished off like that. And I walked away, said bye. And I said, listen, if I'm around the next couple of days, I'll drop in. Now, Charlie was dying of cancer. He had... He had gloves on that had the fingertips cut off and all his skin was peeling off his face. He was physically, like, he had sores all over him. He wasn't in a good place. He wasn't going to last much longer. And I remember saying bye and I left. And as I walked up to the, up to the uh, lift and I pushed the button, I thought, Lord, what just happened then? And I thought, did Charlie just meet with you? Did he just have a moment of having a revelation of your mercy and your grace? I thought, oh, it's doing my head in a little bit. Because I didn't, I didn't pray the sinner's prayer. I didn't do, I think maybe he had a, he had a, he met with you at that moment. You ministered powerfully and that, those cries were cries of repentance. Came back two days later and the whole family were around Charlie's bed as I walked in. And the whole family saw me and the daughter was there. Oh, this is Cam, the Rev. And the family moved out and she said, Dad, uh, the Rev, Cameron's here from, from the footy club. And at this stage she was blind and he reached out his hand and I walked up to him and he grabbed my hand and he pulled me right up to his chest. And he said, thank you, thank you, thank you. God has blessed us with time. He's blessed us with wealth. It's his heart and desire that as his people, we be people who invest what he's granted us, what he's given us, our time and our wealth to see his kingdom come, to see men's hearts bow to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it directs our paths, it leads us, it gives us insight and wisdom and just pray this morning that, Lord, that your word would quicken us and, Lord, we'll be people who don't lament or worry or, or who shrink back, but rather we'll be people of faith, of confidence in you. We place our trust in you. We'll be your people who do, do what we need to do to see your kingdom come and your will be done all around about us. Lord, in the workplace, if there are people that we go to work with that we know that are hurting, Lord, help us to minister your grace and mercy. Give us wisdom and insight. Neighbours and others that we can, Lord, sow and bless and make friends for eternity, I pray. Quicken us. Speak to us. Lead us, we pray. Lord, I thank you. We give you our hearts and our lives. We yield ourselves as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Be Lord of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.